And the other season, fall and winter, are becoming wetter than they used to be. You all know this stuff, don't you? Yes. Well, I'll wait till you get down, but I have a question about uh, agricultural ships when we get to that. Okay. And then the summer precipitation decreases. And in general, like Arkansas is having about a 5% summer precipitation decrease, but northwest Arkansas is having, well, actually northern Arkansas is having a 25% decrease in the summer. And then, like we talked about, the intermittent drought and the downpours, and what that does to soil erosion. Um, why, you know, it makes it more important that we do some water capture probably in the future. Um, and that's probably something that we can get away with doing in, in our part of this country. I mean, you know, like in Colorado, that's, you know, we you can't do that because then you're, you're capturing water that needs to go back into the hydrological system that's already so, um, uh, you know, drought ridden. And then um, increased forest fires, agricultural shifts, and water shortages in general. What were you wanting to say about that? If they know these climate stressors and they know the agricultural shift in Arkansas or the other southern states, they have a prediction of where it could shift to. If they have, are they looking at that sort of thing, or they're just saying this is going to happen? Yeah, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, yes. But I don't really know what they are. Okay. That's what I just asked because yeah. agriculture is so important. So. Yeah, it is. I mean it's a it's the primary part of our economy. Right. I, mean, I think it's easy, but the right planning on growing rice in Maine. <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna get warm up there, huh? Well the Gulf River areas have been up here for quite a long time now, several years, so Aubrey can tell you. No no <coughs> They're all supposed to stay around the coast according to the guidebook, but the guidebook is outdated now. So they, these butterflies have been up here. And I first noticed them, big orange butterflies zipping around in the woods. Oh, the orange the orange Yeah, yeah. yeah so they, They've adapted. Yeah, there's a lot of ecosystem kinds of, uh, you know, biology changes that are happening that we've, I mean, that we've probably all noticed in the last 30 years or so. Um, we didn't used to have our Can I, can I say one more thing? Absolutely. They, they just mentioned the FDR mascot for our climate, or our campaign. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, actually, Razorback would match more with, Maryland has the Terps or their football team. And we we also have terrapins here, but oh, yeah. it wouldn't be natural for us to choose that. So when you say terrapins, are you talking about box turtles? There's probably turtles. Yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. various others, but yeah, I like either one of those. That's great. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I have. Let's start brainstorming. Do you want to? I mean, keep in mind, maybe I'll use this 
for that purpose. See, we did need this, Shelly. Um, keep in mind some of the climate stressors for this area, too. So keep those in mind. Like, um, tornado. bugs too because of I mean these are all symptoms I'm of I'm not sure which ones we ought to put down there. Forest grass and fires. Because all of those things increase the risk of forest fires too. And we're losing sequestration capacity too. Um, are we showing a trend towards less precipitation over a long period of time? It's kind of, more in, in it's minutes. like it's leveling out okay. because we're getting less precipitation um, in the summer, so you have less. So it's just erratic, not. Yeah, it's erratic. When summer, summer droughts, and we're having increased precipitation in the winter and fall as relative to what we used to have. That, we keep a count of how much rain we get yearly, Yeah. and we see that it is still way up there. But we have gotten anywhere from 35 inches per year up to 60 inches per year. And we see that this particular year out in the mountains, we have 45 inches already, which is an annual average, and Fayetteville is seven inches below that. So there's an intermittency within Even, 100 miles yeah. difference of each other, and we're all still hmm. northwest. I wonder Arkansas. if that used to and be we the case got or a not. lot of rain this summer where others didn't. And so we had the two years of super drought, mm -hmm. 2011 and 12, and then we had this year was an excellent year. But I wonder if we're holding it the way we should. Well, when we have the excess precipitation, it's going to flood off, right. you know, flow That's downhill right. really my fast. My stream flows uh, lower Do than the usual. Increased flood. Yeah. yeah. Some of the pools That's have been mm -hmm. That's definitely a pressure. At the same time. Yeah, increased um, ozone uh, because of the increased We're speaking especially to Arkansas now, aren't we? This well, is those are issues in Arkansas. Arkansas. I'm just trying to focus mostly on climate stressors. But but they contribute to this. Like as, as we have more and more heat, right. our environment traps more of those toxins. Mm -hmm. right. I have a question about ozone. I know about 10 or 12 years ago, I started noticing that summer days were so much brighter and it seemed as if there was more glare everywhere. And I don't think it was my eyesight, I really think. And I wonder if it had to do with, yes or no ozone. Yeah, in I our area, in that. our mountains. That's that's probably a Dr. Boss question. And, uh, Actually, haze is an issue in Arkansas and Dakota. Yeah, I'd like to make a Didn't call that out on haze. Yeah. 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 Another thing I noticed years ago was when um, there was, you're talking about haze in the air from the coal plants, is that we got dust storms that came from the, uh, different parts of the United States. They would come over us. And that's drought mm -hmm. and soil degeneration okay. in other places than here that, that it came mm -hmm. here. In 1974 we came went to <coughs> D.C. and then came back in August and uh, the air, the first clear air, it was blue, so blue you could hardly see across the Key Bridge in D.C. and when really? we got back here the first clear air I saw was when we climbed up and into our valley here but that was the last year. That oh, we didn't wow. have 
this blue stuff that I'm 84 and lived in northwest Arkansas since 1942. And so you haven't seen that clarity since I 1974? Had, I haven't seen, uh, I haven't, well, some there sometimes in the winter. You know, yeah. Before. Because I'm in the end of what used to be a 50 inch rainfall circle for 50 years, mm -hmm. according to the mm -hmm. right in the edge of that, and then downstream four miles they don't have. I, I want to make a comment on the fires and forest stress mm -hmm. is that we have a hardwood forest everywhere in Arkansas, and those trees take up, up to 200 gallons of water in a summer's day. It's really hard to get a hardwood forest burning. So mostly it's grass fires we're talking about. Out west, oh, okay. it's totally different. Yeah. Those are resinous evergreens. I was kind of surprised and they just, by that. They just, but I you know. saw that as it's a future prediction for Arkansas. Mm -hmm. This fires mm -hmm. increased forest mm -hmm. fires. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not so much an issue yet, I think, but they're thinking that it's going to Well, I'm wondering if it's from the dead tr dead and dying trees. Yeah. Because we, we can make our firewood now almost off of dead trees. Right. Really? Mm -hmm. right. Well, that connects to the insects. Too, yeah, mm -hmm. right. that was my right. in right. intention when I said about the insects yep. and the dead right. and dying trees. It's the same thing out west. They're having such uh, drought stress that the evergreens that are there, pinyon pines, for example, as well as ponderosas, are getting the bark beetles that used to be in the mm -hmm. southeast right. that did the uh, loblolly pines in. And so now they're having massive die-offs of pinyon pines. Mm -hmm. Not so much the ponderosa yet, but that I've seen. In Can maybe you know. some of those things that are coming out, like that we looked at the Obama administration is doing that was relative specifically to natural systems will help with some of that, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know, we'll see. Oak fungus but is a big danger too what in is our it? area. Oak fungus? Oak fungus. Um, we, we lost a lot. Is that black or white oak? Um, or most, do you know? Uh, mostly white oak. Huh. Most do you guys oak. understand what we're doing? Because um, I think that this could be a really good like first step at thinking about how to put together a community resilience plan. Mm -hmm. Because um, <coughs> you've got to include everybody. You know, and, and, and you've got to um, pull together everybody's knowledge. You know, it's kind of the stuff that, that we've been talking about, um, with that we need diversity and inclusivity, and we've got to build social cohesion. It's like what Joplin did. They were able to, with one track, which was the school systems, bring it all together. Gladys sent out a beautiful movie on Joplin, and it was mostly about the high school and the high school principal, and he did the commentary, but he showed how all of that cohesiveness happened because of the school system. So I can really track what you were saying. Yeah, it was a beautiful you knew about movie. That. And you could feel the, the sense of emotion yeah. which has got to be there. People have to get that pricked before they're gonna start That's wanting so to true. become yeah. part of what is that cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you have to have a sense of the potential loss and it's like nothing happens until a crisis comes and then we respond yeah. beautifully mm -hmm. to disaster. Mm -hmm. But we got to do it ahead of time, yeah, and that's really that's good. the deal right now mm -hmm. from the deniers and liars. Pardon me for getting into that part mm -hmm. of it, but yeah, that's <laughs> so the real put so it. many of yeah. us off track, mm -hmm. so we're not aware of what's really happening. Yes. Hi, Linda. Hi. Um, one of my issues has always been: don't reinvent the wheel. And I was a corporate records and information manager. Right. manager. And one of the biggest parts of my job was disaster preparedness and recovery. Companies have their own best interests at heart and they've got really good people yep. to rely on. We need to make our corporate partners a big part of it. They have the experience, especially insurance companies, they lose the most. They have the most to lose and with all the stuff in Florida, Florida and everything, even maybe somebody from the military. What I'm saying is whatever we do to put together a group, it has to be with the mind to take from the resources we have, and I'm talking corporate, education, all these things, the people whose uh, expertise whose skill sets are right there. Don't let them walk away right. from this. And you and you stroke. Believe me, it's a lot of more important. Stroke 
their ego. I mean, this is just between us. <laughs> their egos. But yeah. they have, you know, your risk managers that you're typing to your and you're all, all your yeah. companies. They have so much to lose. And now that I find, now I'm retired from my uh, professional organization, mm -hmm. but they are talking more and more about, let's not just talk about what happens when a bomb goes off at the company. What do we do tomorrow to protect our assets? Now more and more they're talking about the community because the people living in the community work there. for that. They're yeah. talking about their mental health. Right. And um, we need to, start, you know, not reinvent the wheel, but just go and get these people together in a forum. Well, you're absolutely okay. right. How because, I mean, look what happened with Katrina. And there was a big lesson learned there because it turned out that Walmart and retail establishments, especially Walmart, became integral to the recovery of that area. Absolutely. Because and they're really good at distribution <coughs> right. and logistics. The very two entities that Linda mentioned, insurance and Pentagon, mm -hmm. Munich Ray is the largest insurer in the yeah. whole world. Mm -hmm. And the Pentagon and Munich Ray says right. the biggest problem we have in the whole world mm -hmm. right now is, is climate change. change. Yeah. yeah, and when a, a reinsurer gets on them, you know, mm -hmm. right, like that, right, when they get on board, Everybody yeah. listens. They re they insure the insurance company. And it's a lot of political right. issues. It's a reality issue. Right. It's yeah. a reality issue. And to hear the military, all the chiefs of staff, and I've been seeing a lot of them have been working yeah. on it. A lot of them. Well, they know their bases are going to go underwater. Exactly. <laughs> and they, the, the deployment, and they are. Let's focus on Fayetteville, though. Yeah. Can we? Just oh, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I just think that we probably, like, um, got some solutions in these areas. Like, I mean, you came up with a solution, Linda, because you talked about the need to, and I almost forgot about this and how important it is, to engage the retail establishments and the corporations in our area. But not just in our area, I mean, Walmart's based here in, in Bentonville, but Walmart's everywhere. Right. And really, yeah. like, as communities are doing this community resilience planning, they need to be talking to, it sounds crazy, but like the, the general managers at their Walmart. Yeah. And they and have including the political them. clout to talk to the legislators. Yes. And legislators know that they have an ongoing Yeah. Community. And we had a, we had a, a meeting with Walmart folks um, John Johnson, who's the, the director of the Sustainability Consortium, and he's really interested in resilience from a supply chain perspective. So we did have a meeting with him, and, and who was at the table was who you're talking about, the emergency manager, um, yeah, risk management and emergency management for Walmart. And he's amazing. I mean, his, and his background is really incredible. He didn't always work in retail. But, um, but, uh, I, you know, we asked them, I was like, well, okay, so we're saying that retail needs to be part of the community resilience planning process, but how do you do that really? Like, what should we do? And so I asked them as the higher-ups at Walmart, you know, and they said, well, you know, the communities need to be um, talking to the general managers of the stores. And I was like, well, are, are you guys from the top down going to be telling general managers to be expecting, you know, people to be coming to them to talk about community resilience planning? And, you know, they were kind of like, well, yeah, but it may take a while, you know. But, you know, Walmart can do anything they want to as fast as they want to. Well, so I just wondered about that, because I've heard that um, actually these stores only have a three-day extra supply, and they're, they're dependent on all these trucks coming in, so we have a nice storm and nothing can come in. So are, are there anything, is there anything planned like that? They, they can't just immediately take care of that. Yeah, they, they actually do better than the government. I mean, that's generally what's been found. They're but much better at, um, at getting the distribution in because they have more tightly knit um, distribution networks for supplies. But this is the new way, is to have just a mem minimal amount of goods in just stores. Every day. Uh -huh. And it's everywhere. That seems to be the idea mm -hmm. of how to do things because you have too much in stock. I know that's what we did in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like have your three-day supply. Your well, mostly there's no redundancy. In other words, mm -hmm. unless the gasoline is there and the trucks are there and they're coming from the places of origin. Yeah, but I haven't heard about Walmart changing their policy. I mean, I would think that they wouldn't be doing anything that would decrease their resilience because that's something that they are mm -hmm. thinking about. 
Yeah, I'd just like to focus on Walmart and supply chain. So it would seem to me that local municipalities should start a dialogue with them saying, what is your priority if an ice storm happens? Um, this is the priority of the local um, transportation department. You know, how can we help each other? Right. Um, and sort of facilitate so we have a, a map of where we're going to go. Yeah. So I think, I mean, one of the things that we're talking about here is like making sure that you've got all the right players at the table and you're not leaving anybody out that should be at the table of planning, you know. So, I mean, a lot of times that's called the stakeholder building process. You yeah. know, we want to make sure that retail management is there, like they're at the table at all, and that they're not just omitted from the process. So I'm glad that you brought that up, Linda. What are some of the other things? Let's start with something. Let's start with governance, because we know some of the things that, that um, that Fayetteville has done, like right off the top of our head. So this column is like what we've done, you know. Well, Star is one, isn't it? Yeah. So, and um, and then these are things that we need to do. Well, we have yeah. like building director. I mean, that, that wasn't that always. So it was it Dan Cody for the first sustainability director? I think so. Yeah, John Coleman. And now they actually call them sustainability and resilience directors. They've changed the, the department title. Yeah. And we, we did do the star rating. So that helps because that's an assessment tool that we've already got. So we're not just starting from scratch whenever. The plan um, is that I know of, I've heard Peter say this, is that um, the community resilience plan will be a part of the city's um, 2030 plan. I think it's 2035, actually. I think it's 2035. But um, you know how cities always, they, cities do this. They have these like vision plans for the, for the city. And so they're wanting the community resilience plan to be a part of that. Because that's something that they're already doing. And that's kind of like what you were saying about not reinventing the wheel. Um, Baltimore, that was one of the lessons that they learned, was one of the first things that you want to do um, when you're looking at, at doing a community resilience plan is look and see what's already being done. You know, because a lot of the stuff that could be done under, you know, the realm of sustainability and mitigation or addressing social justice issues could also be the same thing that you would be doing if you were trying to make your community more resilient. Maybe it's already happening. And so that's what we're trying to do here in these areas. What are some of the things that we know about? I mean, what about the community radio? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's social. Yeah. Definitely going to answer that community connection. And what particular radio are we talking about? I know NPR is on campus, but NPR is having its own problems and yeah. the sides that it wants to be on. Okay, thank you. On the university. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, they do. They have a radio station. Be, be pressed into emergency. So, um, like, mm -hmm. um, and then another media network. Maybe that's something that we need. If I write something in this column, it belongs over here on the strong arrow. The media, when, whenever we noticed this and we started to get something moving. <coughs> the media, they'll say, oh, we had a snow thing and what, uh, this is what's happening. Nobody in the media, one lousy weather guy, should be saying, connecting it to the global climate pattern. And they don't. That we, and we tend to do this, we all do this, we tend to think of us. We do not think of the interconnectivity. So, A, I'll bet a lot of people in Facebook do not know about the star rating. It's, it, and they should be, you know, tooting their own horn three out of five. But the media should know more about it, too, because this is something you have to grow from them. You're going to have to grow from the bottom up. And people have to be aware of it before they start asking about it. So, like, or they start to be on the government. You know, mm -hmm. like, we need more um, communication integration. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. people don't know about it. They don't care. All they think, and that you say global warming, it's a, it, it has become a political issue. Right. And it shouldn't be. It's a survival. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, the, and the church community is doing the same kind of thing. Everybody on the same talking page. It could take a while. Is there a marketing campaign through the sustainability department yeah. for outreach and more like education outreach for the city promote itself? You can start in mm-hmm. school. Yeah, the schools are really in colleges. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I guess, Chris, there is, but maybe it's just not as effective as it could be. Like, you what can go you? to the city website. But are they going out and talking to people, telling people, and mm-hmm. putting out signs? You know? Mm-hmm. I mean, that would seem like a really good idea. Yeah, just to get people involved in there. Where, where would, what would that look like? Like more, more community outreach from the, yeah. from the city? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the, there's a church of Latter-day Saints in, Fa- in <coughs> Fa- Bentonville, and every year they have a survival thing. Mm-hmm. And it has gotten so big. You can't get near there. You can't afford mm-hmm. there. People have told each other about survival. Now, some of it are the people who are like, oh, good, that's all I need. But other <laughs> people are talking about dry foods yeah. and dry water. I ordered the survivalist magazine. Battles, you and know. I love all that stuff. I mean, not that now when there were survival the people, now they're in the DSM five yeah. being lack of. But you know what I mean? It's <coughs> beginning to be very interesting to people who are normally rational people. Yeah, I'm going to start uh, keeping canned goods or I'm going to mm-hmm. start. And more interested in what is the part of what are the people around them doing? What is their government? What is their community doing? At least it's getting, you know, maybe it's getting a fringe in there. At least it's getting out. Go to the church, anywhere where people congregate. We yeah. would love to hear about this kind of thing. So we have community gardens, we have an urban farm. Yeah. We have urban farms. <coughs> we have several non profits that sort of yeah, run those. That are already established, sort of, mm-hmm. kind of like the schools. They have a network. Yeah, there is a network. I wonder if we also need the like a farmers network because I'm thinking about, um, uh, you know, we had a lot of snow last winter, and some of the new houses caved in. Thinking about Jesse. What? New houses. houses. To cover them. Mm-hmm. Where you can grow mm-hmm. food, mm-hmm. grow food in the winter time. Good houses. Oh. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. They're like little greenhouses, tiny oh, greenhouses. Some of them are big Oh, okay. I'm those sorry. are grow covered. Grow the the hoop houses are bigger. Kids, so I don't yeah. know. Yeah. know yeah. It's like a greenhouse, but it's made with um, like PVC pipe and plastic. Oh, it's not so cheap for the chickens. And easy to put up there. It's cheaper and easy to put up there. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But they, a lot of times, will cave in if they get too much snow on them depending on how they're built, which is a huge problem. So, like, we had a uh, community-supported agriculture, so we have we have CSAs in town, but one of them had to close because it got snowed in. So, what would have happened if we had, like, a farmer's network a farmer, yeah. where people were communicating and wanting to help each other bounce back from mm-hmm. that kind of a resilient or climate stressor. We don't have that sort of climate No, I don't think so. This is an agrarian state. It's a very important thing. I don't know, I'm just calling it a farmer's network, you know. Because I mean, Don was talking about food to table in the box, whatever it is.